So um, uh, we're going to we're going to go through um, the word. We're looking at intercession, and we're looking at the word pagar. And um, I've got this session and one more session to go on that. And what I'd like to do, if it's okay with you, is I'd like to um, briefly go over a few of the things that I said last week before I give fresh material. And uh, the reason is that is that I messed up the video. And so some people are asking me for the video who couldn't attend. And I said I didn't have it. So uh, I don't think it, it, it I think I think it's good to go over it. I, I, I won't take long. And I think you'll appreciate it because things don't necessarily go in first time round. So we're looking at this word pagar, which is commonly translated in the Old Testament uh, as intercessor. And here's the key verse, Isaiah 59, 16. He saw, God saw there was no man and wondered that there was no intercessor, Pagar. Therefore, his arm brought salvation for himself and his own righteousness sustained him. It's incredible that God is looking for intercessors. Um, it's incredible that Jesus lives evermore to intercede. Uh, so intercession is so important to God. And the reason that intercession is so important to God is because intercession bridges the gap between God's will and God's manifestation of his will. So prayer changes things. I know sometimes um, uh, our prayer is tested when we don't see immediately change. But I think sometimes in, in prayer, it's a little bit like they call a tipping point. You know, you pray and you pray and you pray and others pray and just doesn't, nothing seems to be happening, you know, visibly. Um, but at that time when we're praying, many things are happening invisibly. I always think of Daniel, who was an intercessor. He stood in the gap, didn't he, for the return of, of, of the Jews after 70 years in Babylon. And what did he do? He took Jeremiah's word that prophesied they'd be there 70 years. He didn't just leave it, but he began to pray it. He began to be the man that was in the gap between God's will, 70 years and release, and the manifestation of God's will. And so Daniel prayed for three weeks. And, you know, it says nothing about what he experienced during that three weeks. Um, and I don't think he did experience much at all. I think he just prayed and prayed and fasted and prayed. And during those three weeks, there's no evidence that he felt anything that he had any revelation or anything. He just kept on interceding, being the bridge and uh, taking the being the bridge of the gap between God's will in heaven and manifesting it on earth. And then, you know, the story, don't you? All of a sudden, um, the angel Gabriel, or sorry, Michael, or no, Gabriel, or was it? Okay, Michael came later. An angel, sorry, I'm getting mixed up. An angel came through and uh, said, from the moment you prayed, you were heard. But we had resistance in the invisible realm. We were resisted by different pre princes. And in fact, I needed to get the, the specific angel associated with Israel, Prince Michael, and, and an angel to come and help us so I could bring the breakthrough um, um, to you. So intercession is very, very practical, very, very powerful. But we have to understand that it first happens in the spiritual realm, if I can use that, before being birthed or breaking through into the visible realm. And so be encouraged, because when you were praying for the lost earlier on, um, you know, we're, we're building up a weight in the heavens. We're building up a weight. And when I say a tipping point, a tipping point is when something uh, keeps getting gathered and gathered. There's a, there's a momentum, there's something happening. Uh, and then there comes a tipping point when it just breaks through. It just breaks through. It's sort of like not seen, not seen. And then it's getting bigger and bigger. And then the tipping point is when it all flows through. So um, we're looking for tipping points. Um, a revival is a tipping point when the prayers and worship of God's people and prophecy, preaching, all come together 
in such a strong way that it can't be held back anymore and uh, it floods out. There's been a, 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 a tipping point. So keep on interceding. Keep on being the woman or the man in between what God has said and what God's will is known and its manifestation. God is looking for a person and a people that will stand in the gap um, uh, for, for, the, for, the, for the land. And so um, we, we looked at Pagar can mean various things. And we looked that Pagar can also mean hitting the mark, Job 37, 32. Uh, God covers his hands with lightning and commands it to strike Pagar, the mark. And so Pagar can mean to hit the mark. And as I said last week, we won't go into detail, but it's a, a, a good reminder for those that were here last week. Prayer must strike the mark. Prayer must hit the target and pagar hits the target so we want we want god we want to find the target and hit it and hit it and to hit it so you know we we what we do, we don't want to be praying around and doing this and that what we want is the holy spirit to help us um you know almost like a telescopic lens you know on a sniper rifle and go right to the target and I said last week that sometimes you can tell sometimes when we're praying together or when you're praying, sometimes you can just sense when the prayers are really hitting targets. And, and I find, you know, how well, I find that if I'm in a prayer meeting and someone starts hitting the target and I can feel them in their prayers hitting the target and not just praying about the situation that's all right but now bang their words that they're saying the anointing is it's hitting the target i find myself saying amen as i just amen well i'm thinking that's hitting it amen and so sometimes when when people say amen and, and mean it you know during the thing you know you, you haven't finished and they said amen but you're you're you're, you're praying and someone's going amen amen it's because they are feeling that your pagar is hitting the mark. So you can have, you can be praying about a subject, you know, we pray this, we pray that. And I'm not decrying that all prayer mixed with faith has an effect, but I love it when you hit the mark or when I'm praying or when you're praying in your devotions or whatever, and you pray and you suddenly get a prayer flow or you suddenly get a momentum or a motivation or an energy and then you begin to pray and for those few moments bang 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 you know you're hitting the mark and I think that's a very important principle about intercession seeking to hit the mark and also the, you hear about prayer warriors and intercessors as warriors and part of that comes from this word pagar that can mean to strike as in battle and so here, here's just a use of pagar which means in which was normally translated intercession but here we find that the king tells the guards um kill the priests because they're with david and because they knew he fled and didn't tell me but the servants of the king would not lift their hands to strike pagar the priests of the Lord. And then here in another passage, I'll put these notes on, um, on, on our Holy Spirit chat group. Rise up and attack us, they said to Gideon and used the word, word pagar. And so pagar can also be used in the sense of genuine spiritual warfare, because in the, um, the passage that I read about no one to intercede, it's got a military feel to it. The Lord saw it and it displeased him and displeased him in Isaiah 59 that there was no justice. He saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no one to intercede. Now, look, the next picture, as I said last week, is the picture of God being a warrior to bring about his will and to be almost his own intercessor. Uh, his own arm brought him salvation, his righteousness upheld him. And here's the echoes of Ephesians 6, the armor of Ephesians 6. Um, he put righteousness on a breastplate, breastplate of righteousness, helmet of salvation on his head, garments of vengeance for clothing, zeal as a cloak, 
and then he goes off to crush the enemies. And of course, Ephesians 6, when it talks about um, putting on the armor of God, it's also talking about spiritual warfare. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against rulers, authorities, uh, spiritual powers and spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. So I remind you of that to show that the whole context there is intercessor doing warfare. And if we uh, and straight after, of course, the armor of God in Ephesians six, it talks about the sword of the spirit. I often mention that at these meetings. The sword of the spirit, which is the rhema word of God. It's the scripture. It's the word that you get to use, to intercede with, to smash the enemy and to bring forth God's um, God's will in a matter. So Daniel, he had the sword of the spirit, didn't he? Daniel had the rhema word. What was it? It was the quote from Jeremiah. And so he's read it. And he got it as a rhema word. Daniel's sword of the spirit was the passage from Jeremiah that prophesied that the um, that the Jews would be able to return um, after 70 years. So that's a, a little bit of a, a recap with some extras of um, last week. So just moving on a little bit, not going to do too much more tonight, but another way of using pagar the word for intercession that we're looking at is claiming territory for God, claiming territory for God. In fact, there uh, on the notes, I've put the sort of dictionary of what pagar means to encounter. Uh, um, um, Saul encountered the prophets and the spirit of the Lord came upon him. And that and when Saul encountered the prophets, the word was Pagar. So Pagar is a is an encounter, a meeting, a connection. Um, it's a, a strike uh, as well and uh, an attack. But here it, it's also touching the boundary. It is used in the um, book of Joshua, touching the boundary. Um, I won't go into the passage here. And so there's a sense that that Pagar can also mean pushing back the boundaries. And what what I what what the best way for me to express this pushing back the boundaries, sorry, I have um you won't be able to read it, I guess, but I, I have just up here to my left the prayer of Jabez. I love the prayer of Jabez. I mean, I love it. I mean, we pray the Lord's Prayer uh, and J, the prayer of Jabez, 1 Chronicles 4.10 is up there. And I like this because this sort of illustrates this pagar, because the prayer of Jabez is this. And Jabez called on the God of Israel, uh, saying, oh, that you would bless me indeed and enlarge my territory, that your hand would be with me. And that you would keep me from evil, that I may cause no pain. So God granted him what he requested. And it's that that you would bless me indeed and enlarge my territory. So Pagar Paka, is coming to a territory or a border and pushing it out, extending our boundaries. Oh, that you would enlarge my territory territory now this again is very powerful spiritual truth isn't it because um the kingdom of god comes by force and the forceful take it and so there's an idea here uh, that jesus is saying that there is a forcefulness in the spirit that brings god's kingdom and extends god's kingdom so we should never, not that we do, but we should never just just allow things to remain as they are. We should always have this sort of pioneering spirit in intercession. Sometimes, uh, uh, you know, and it's natural, sometimes we tend to intercede in reaction or in response to something. And that's all right. So 
you know, uh, I don't think I was praying much for Ukraine until, you know, it looked like Russia were going to invade. And then when we heard that Russia were going to invade, you know, we began to start praying in response. And then Russia invaded and we be, we had an evening as, and we keep praying, but we had a special evening praying in, in response. We've heard of sh what's going on in Sri Lanka. I don't know if anybody was praying for them before this news, but we're praying in response and all that's appropriate. But I think where it says pagar and it's claiming territory for God, that's really what it means in this sense, claiming territory for God, then we also have to push the boundaries back, not just pray in response. Of course, we should. But also we need to take the um, the offensive. Yeah, the offensive. We need to sort of be open to the spirit and say, right. You know, we're not just treading water. We're not just defending our patch. We're not just um, reacting to the enemy and to and to the kingdom of darkness in history. We will. But we need to say, Lord, where can we pray to extend? And Pastor Peter had a very powerful word for our church a couple of years ago that is really still 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 strong as a, a sword of the spirit today. And it was, you know, enlarge that one enlarge the um, tent pegs of your tent, enlarge the tent pegs of your tent, prepare for enlargement. So that is a that is a sword of the spirit that is a pagar in the sense of coming to a border and pushing it out, increasing it. So when we pray, your kingdom come, your will be done. And we're, we're, we're praying for the, you know, the schools to have a godly influence. We're praying, you know, for churches to multiply. We're, we're, we're praying, we are, we are outward looking. We are wanting to, to expand our influence and the influence of the kingdom of God. That's Pagar, that's Pagar. Next week, I'll do the final, I've got one more to do tonight, but next week I'll do the final sense of Pagar, which is very strong, which is basically arguing with God, <laughs> with his arguments, but arguing with God, um, interceding and entreating God. And then I'll go through all of them again. But, but this idea of taking territory should be important in our lives. And then finally tonight, uh, with the last one coming next week, we have um, Pagar can be carrying a, what I've put a prayer burden from the Lord. Uh, look at this. A uh, very famous passage, Isaiah 53, 6. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And the word laid is pagar. So the Lord has pagard on him the sin of us, of us all. And, you know, with the, some of the other uh, aspects of Pagar. You can look, the Lord has, you know, struck him almost because the word can mean strike. The Lord has struck him, uh, the, the iniquity of us all. The, the Lord has, you know, hit the mark by putting the iniquity of, of, of us all on him. The Lord has encountered him with the iniquity of us all. The Lord has put him in this spiritual warfare situation of carrying the, the, the enemy of sin that's of us all. So you can look at how, when you get to know the different nuances of Pagar, how when you see it in one thing, a lot of the other sort of uh, uh, things of violence, of encounter, um, sort of move forward. And my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Well, in the next verse, Luke 22, we just see him carrying this burden that he was going to carry on the cross fully, of course. But we see this incredible burden of preparation to die for the sins of the world in prayer and being in agony. He was praying fervently. His sweat became like drops of blood falling down upon the ground in the garden of, of Gethsemane. There was Jesus with the most intense burden or pagar that you could possibly have. And so the burden of the Lord would often come upon the prophets. 
And one of the big things about the prophets was that they didn't just prophesy, they also were great intercessors. The prophets were there to intercede um, and, and pray, um, and God would put the burden of the Lord. In, in fact, sometimes the prophet, where it says, um, the word of the Lord came to me, sometimes in the Old Testament, we've translated the word of the Lord came to me, but it's the burden of the Lord came to me, not the word pagar, but another word for burden of the Lord. And so a burden is something that's heavy on you. You feel it. You're carrying a heavy burden. You feel its pressure upon you. And so pagar in intercession can mean a prayer burden, a prayer burden. And they're not, I'm not saying that they're going to be like the ones in Gethsemane. That is the ultimate prayer burden, isn't it? That Jesus was carrying the burden to pray through to get ready for the cross. But God sends pagar burdens onto our lives as intercessors. And the, these can be small burdens. Uh, you, you, can just, you can just have a burden for somebody else. You know, it, it can be this small. It can just be so-and-so came to my mind today and I said a prayer for them. That's a prayer burden. And then that was it. You, oh, this came to mind. Oh, Lord, I just pray you bless them. I haven't thought them for a while. I pray their, their job or whatever you pray. And then you move on in the day and you think well that, that wasn't a very big burden it was a burden though it was a, a prayer burden it was just a quick light prayer burden that you um you had you prayed through in a matter of seconds and uh, you moved on the burden was lifted or you can have a, a a stronger burden for someone and these burdens come from the lord it's not just you wanting to pray it there's a burden there's a sense of god putting somebody on your heart or it might be there's a nation, you carry a, a prayer burden for a particular nation or a particular city or um, a, a, a particular aspect of God's truth. There's just something. It, it's like uh, it doesn't mean as much to others, but it means more to you. And um, sometimes when God gives you a strong burden of prayer, sometimes you have to be careful because you don't understand why everybody else doesn't feel like you do. So often someone with a very strong burden for a nation or something like that they're like why aren't you why don't you care what's happening in this nation and people are like well we care we care for every nation no but this nation this nation this nation well don't get angry at the people that don't have the burden god gave you the burden not to tell everybody else for not having the burden they can have their own but god gave you a burden and, and because it means so much to you to pray through, um, don't expect others to necessarily also have the, the same prayer burden, because otherwise that can be a bit frustrating. And uh, you can also be counterproductive if you're going around telling everybody off for not having the same burden that God gave you. And sometimes these burdens can, can be like that. Sometimes these burdens, they come upon you, you have to pray them through and they don't lift until you get in your spirit, a sense of, yeah, I've done it. I've done what I've needed to do. So there's times when I've had prayer burdens for this or for that, and it's just been there. And I just find myself praying about it a lot, day by day, week by week, month by month. I remember one particular burden. I was just praying. It wasn't like, you know, I, I mean, it wasn't exhausting. It wasn't I wasn't being woke up at night with the prayer burden. Sometimes that happens, but it was just on me, this thing. I just it wasn't like I rem put it on my prayer list. It was just on me just when, when I was praying or it would just come to me and I'd pray for it. It just it wouldn't go away. It was there. It was there. And I remember praying and praying and praying and praying week in, month in, month out. Just this burden was there. This motivation was there that the Lord had given me. And then I came to a point where I thought, that's it. That's it. Nothing had happened, but I knew that I had done my duty, or oh, if, if that's the right word, I, I had, the burden had lifted, and that I had, from my perspective, um, fulfilled that prayer burden. It, you know, the thing was still important, I just didn't feel that sense of, of wanting to pray about it anymore. It wasn't that I was bored of it, it was just the burden to do that had completed, uh, had been completed. So, Burdens come in all shapes, forms and sizes, but it is good to recognize and they can be very temporary and quick or they can that you can be carrying a burden for the Lord in prayer 
for your whole life, you could have a burden for some particular thing. You might have a burden, a particular burden for, you know, um, the unborn, uh, you, you know, all, all, the, all these things. We all should have a burden for the unborn, the abortion. But there'll be some people that will have a particular burden to, to stand for that and to pray for that. So that's the last one, Pagar carrying the prayer burden. Next week, I'm going to um, finish by talking about how we wrestle with God in prayer with Pagar and how we can argue with God. It sounds a bit strange, but it's, it's, a good, it's a good thing. And we'll go through everything once more time. And then we'll, we'll have this insight, I hope, into this word for prayer, Pagar. It's different elements so that we can be available to move in these different elements. Because if you don't know how prayer can work, then chances are you won't be open to doing it in this mode or that way. And um, Ephesians 6 does say, you know, praying with all kinds of prayers. So what we're doing with Pagar is just looking at different ways of interceding and then we just hope we just ask the holy spirit how shall we intercede and move one way or the other 